Hollywood Exiles. It tells the story of how my grandfather, Charlie Chaplin, and many others were caught up in a campaign to root out communism in Hollywood. Hollywood Exiles from CBC Podcasts and the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the documentary from the BBC World Service. Our kibbutz is beautiful. The people are amazing. What happened to it? I have friends who've been murdered. I have friends whose family members are kidnapped. My children are screaming, don't take them, don't take them, don't kill our dad. They are telling them he'll be back. We don't kill, we don't kill, he'll be back. And they drive away. The only thing that we heard was that he's alive, but that was a long time ago. No other news, unfortunately. Saturday, October the 7th, 2023. The day starts peacefully, normally, but as dawn breaks, a massacre unfolds. First, the Palestinian militant group Hamas fires thousands of rockets into the communities of southern Israel. The barrage provides cover for a terrifying, unprecedented second phase. Thousands of members of the group, which is designated a terrorist organization by the UK, US and other countries, break through the perimeter fence and into Israeli territory. They film as bulldozers tear away the metal barrier and crowds stream through it. Some are on motorbikes, many more are on foot, and they begin to run. Just a few miles away, hundreds of people have gathered at a music festival. As the rockets fly overhead, Palestinian gunmen attack the party from several directions. It was one of the worst days in Israel's history. Its people killed in cold blood, hundreds of hostages dragged away, a nation traumatized. Those who survived, who lost loved ones on October the 7th, or have family members still held hostage in Gaza, want to tell their story. I'm Anna Foster, and this is an account of what happened on that day. All of the stories you're about to hear are graphic and distressing. We draw, we try to pass people around because everyone was scattered around. And we also tried to help out people uh, to take them with us. We already uploaded most of our equipment, so we didn't have much room, but we tried to save people along the way. Describe that moment to me. They were fleeing for their lives. They were trying to find a way to get out of there as fast as they could with minimum damage. At 6.30 in the morning, Gilad Karplus was at the Nova Music Festival when red alert sirens began to sound in southern Israel. It's a familiar noise, and it means that rockets are being fired from Gaza. Israelis living in those border communities know the drill well, but this time, something was different. I didn't see, I heard. It was 6.30 in the morning. Naomi Adler was with her husband and three children at home in the kibbutz of Nahal Oz. My three boys were asleep in their room, which is our shelter. And we woke up to 10 minutes of nonstop bombings. We ran into the safe room, shut the metal door, shut the metal window, and just stayed there. And my husband and I just held each other, and I was just saying, what the hell's going on? What the hell's going on? What is this? What is this? And it just wouldn't stop. Families ran to shut themselves desperately into their safe rooms. Nearly all Israeli homes near Gaza have them, but they were designed to protect against rocket attacks, not infiltrations. Many don't have locks and aren't fireproof. As the violent attacks started to spread, Hamas's military wing announced in a 10-minute recorded message published online the start of what it called Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. It urged Palestinians to attack Israeli communities with whatever weapons they had. 
In Nahal Oz, the Edan family took shelter inside their safe room, but it didn't protect them from what was to be a horrifying ordeal. אני רק אציין שב-7 באוקטובר, מאיה נרצחה. On the 7th of October, מאיה was murdered. מאיה is no longer with us. So we are now only five members in the family, because Tzachi is also right now a hostage in Gaza. But this is the family, and Maya will remain a member of our family, only that she will remain always 18 years old. At the Nova Music Festival, Hamas attackers had begun to shoot and kill. Some flew from Gaza on motorized paragliders. More than 260 party goers were murdered at the site. I spoke to Gilad, unplanned, just two days later, on the 9th of October. We saw him in the street with a white bandage around his head and asked if he'd been attacked. Gilad and I sat down and he remembered his dramatic escape. It was one of the first detailed accounts of what happened at the Nova Festival. We got into a uh, collision course with the eight terrorists. They wore a uh, half military uh, uniform, Israeli uniform. They wore uh, shirts, Israeli military shirts. And they were uh, ridden on motorcycles and guns. We hit two of them with our car. And they, they started chasing us. And they shot a bullet on the side. And from the shrapnel of that bullet, it hit my head in the back. I started bleeding. I don't know what was the situation there, if I had a bullet in my skull or not. I didn't know anything. I just only knew I need to hold my head as tightly as I can so I won't bleed out. And I also had to stay awake because I couldn't go to sleep. I knew that if I was going to sleep, I think it would be over. Later on, we got into a kibbutz called Beri. At first, we honked our horn because we thought maybe there was a security guard that can give us any information or anything like that and fastly we knew that there was nothing there we found a uh, shower bathroom unit we broke in we had to break the glass and get inside and hide and because all the the floor was with glass we had to stay super quiet because we knew that they can know where we were By now, Israelis were waking to live news reports beginning to detail the destruction. A lot still wasn't known. Those who had loved ones in the south began frantically searching for information. Michael Levy knew his brother Orr and Orr's wife Einav were at the Nova Festival. I woke up at 6.34 a.m. I still remember the exact time. I woke up to the noise of sirens. I immediately turned on the TV and to try and understand what's going on. And I saw it's all over the place. I called my mother because I saw there are sirens where they live as well. So I wanted to check on them. Uh, she said that they are okay, but that all when they now went to the Nova Festival uh, in rain. And that they all texted her that uh, they are heading back. They got there at 6.20 a.m., about 10 minutes before hell started. A few minutes after, he texted her again, uh, saying that they are hiding in a bomb shelter next to the road. The day after, we saw it uh, on one of the newspapers. One of the doors was still open. So they ran from their car into the bomb shelter to hide. Uh, from inside, all caught my mother, terrified. Uh, my mother heard it uh, in his voice and asked him, oh, what's going on? Is everything okay? And the only thing he told her was, mom, you don't want to know what's going on here. And that was the last thing we heard from them. That was 7.39 a.m. About 10 minutes after, and I know this now because I had to watch horrible videos. A group of terrorists arrived to this bomb shelter and started throwing grenades into it and shooting into it. 
murdering Aina and 17 other people and kidnapping all uh, along with three others. Our kibbutz is beautiful. The people are amazing. What happened to it? I had no idea that it happened elsewhere. I had no idea about the about Kfar Aza or Reim and the party and Be'eri. I have friends in all of those places. I have friends who've been murdered. I have friends whose family members are kidnapped. Hours after the attacks were launched, the Israel Defense Forces finally started to regain some control. It was a long and bloody process. In Nahal Oz, Gali Idan and her family were trying to survive inside their safe room. As she comforted her distraught younger children, her husband Sahi and their eldest daughter, 18-year-old Mayan, knew that danger was getting closer. <laughs> The door is already closed. Sachi is holding the door handle. And we hear steps uh, inside the house on the glasses that were shattered. And we understand that they are coming towards us. And then we heard in Hebrew, open the door, open the door. And then I heard somebody with an accent saying, we are not shooting, we don't shoot, we don't shoot. Sachi was grabbing the handle and uh, and stayed with it and we couldn't lock the we don't have a lock in this uh, door of the mamad of the uh, security room so Sachi was holding the handle very strongly and the children are screaming and there is a chaos in the room and we don't have light inside the uh, security room it is dark and Mayan is uh, seeing that uh, they are starting to open the door. She sees that uh, they are starting to open the door because there were three people. We know afterwards, we knew that there were three people trying to, to open this door, three terrorists. And then Mayan jumped on the door. Mayan stood and told Sachi to grab the door. And they are screaming outside, we don't shoot, we don't shoot. But then they shot, they shot on the door, and Mayan got a bullet, she was hit. But we didn't understand it at that moment. Sachi was screaming, who was shot, who was shot, who was hit? And, and then he, he screamed, it's Mayan, and she, she just laid beside him. She fell down beside him. And they have succeeded to open the door, they moved him behind the door and they turned on the light and there were screamings and Sachi is shouting find where she's bleeding from find where Mayan is bleeding from I can't see where she's bleeding from and she was in a huge puddle of blood and then I've checked her and then I've I've seen that uh, that, that the heat was in the head and it was a critical injury and they have shouted at us to get out of the uh, security room. And we both, I've just told the children, don't look. And I took the children out. The Hamas gunmen held them captive meters away from Mayan's body. Then the attackers started to live stream the family's ordeal on Gali's own Facebook account. Eventually, Sahi is dragged away from his wife and children and taken as a hostage to Gaza. And my children are screaming, don't take them, don't take them, don't kill our dad. And they are saying, don't worry, he'll be back. He'll be back. They are telling them, he'll be back. We don't kill, we don't kill, he'll be back and they drive away and then we are left there we still hear missiles we hear shooting all around us and we don't move because they told us that if we move 
We ו- will die. ולא זזות, כי אמרו לנו שאם נזוז, אנחנו נמות. Close by, in Kibbutz Beri, Gilad was still hiding, hours after fleeing from the Nova festival. It was a very stressful situation. The police also came with a dead body from the party, and we had to evacuate it also. He was half dead, half alive, but when we got to the extraction point, he was already de- uh, deceased. And then after that, they took me to the hospital with a different ambulance. And all the way, you can see all the carnage, all the, the death, all the smoke. 18 hours after we went in, IDF army got us out. After fearing they would be murdered, Naomi, her husband and children finally emerged from their safe room in Nahal Oz. We had exactly two, three minutes to pack whatever we could think of. At that moment, we remembered to bring my ID, but we didn't remember to bring shoes for our kids. But I said, don't worry about it, it's fine. We'll be fine, but we're getting out. I saw fires everywhere. It was one o'clock in the morning. It was very, it was a scene from a movie. My car and my husband's car and our neighbor's two cars were burnt all the way down to the sheer, only the frame was left. It was a full-on war zone. Michael was trying to piece together information about the fate of his brother Or and sister-in-law Einav. He learned that she was killed and he had been kidnapped. I started obsessively calling uh, all the hospitals and asking if they saw someone who matches their description. There were also a lot of lists of people that survived uh, the attack from the Nova Festival. So I started gathering those and looking for them. I started calling friends, uh, calling family that might have heard something. But unfortunately, I couldn't. I couldn't find them. With the help of, of good friends, we started to gather any piece of information about this bomb shelter. At first, we wanted to understand where it was because there are quite a few. So uh, I got a video of them inside. Then I saw a painting of the outside wall of the bomb shelter. And we contacted the person who painted it to make sure there is only one painting like this in the same area. And then I spoke to survivors from this shelter. It took us a few days to pick up all the pieces and and understand what happened. Then, after four days, they told us about Hinav. And after eight days, they told us Paul was kidnapped. On the 8th of October, the Israeli security cabinet retrospectively declared that a state of war had officially begun on the morning of the 7th. The scale of what had happened was becoming clear. Buses took us to a nearby army base, about 20 minutes away. I saw fires. I saw dead bodies. Naomi told me about the relief of being reunited with her community, but then the trauma of discovering who was missing. When we got to the army base and I was finally able to see my neighbors and my friends, I saw one neighbor who was just there crying and she said, they shot my daughter. My daughter's dead. She's 18. She was 18. They shot her in the head and they kidnapped her father. And everyone there in that army base at three o'clock in the morning is reunited and, and, and looking around and saying, who's here? Who's not? What happened? She's talking about Gali, and the story you heard her describe is about Mayan's murder and Saki's kidnapping. Gali was, and still is, hugely traumatized by what she's been through. When we sat and talked, she told me gently that she was having that conversation, recalling the worst moments of her life in stark detail 
for Sahi because she wanted to do anything that might free him. I want Sahi to, go, to come back now, not tomorrow, not in two days, not in one month, not in five years as we saw that it can happen. I want him now back at the house, at my home. Naomi knew how lucky she was that her family had escaped still complete. Both of my sons were throwing up. They were shaking uncontrollably. I just could hold them and say, we're safe, we're safe, we're safe. Gilad was also able to tell his loved ones that he'd survived. It must have been a huge relief for your family to know that you were safe. Did you call them? How did you contact them? I couldn't safe? call them for a good a couple of hours because if I would have called them, I would probably be dead. And my dad, he also, he lives in Africa, in Kenya. Can imagine what has been going through here is mine. What happened after our interview shows you how tense things still were two days on, on the 9th of October. The sirens sounded again in Ashkelon as we sat and talked. We and the team had to run to take cover from another huge barrage of rockets. Mayan's family held her funeral without her father, Sahi. Gali asked us to be there and to share the story of their pain. I'm standing here and I still cannot believe. Cannot believe that they've shut down the livelihood out of your tears and that this is your time to be over from this earthy world and to bury your body in the ground and you have stopped stopped from being being the one who came to this world to wide the rooms of my heart I miss you because I'm shattered into pieces I'm broken because in that damn day they also took dead not only you they took, you they have taken for good. But that they took too. They took, they took him to Gaza, took to Gaza. And he's not here. Oh, you've been murdered. Your blood is on dad's hands and feet. And he's broken. And they took him. I wish he will come back healthy and alive and in one piece and that that you are watching over dad wherever you are i left everything behind on october 7th my job my day-to-day -day routine and even my time with my family I have one mission in life now, and it is to bring all and the rest of the hostages back. Michael is still doing everything he can to get his brother released. A ray of light amidst the darkness of war. On the 24th of November, some hostages were freed every day for a week. Tonight, a temporary ceasefire appears to be holding. But Michael's them, brother Orr was never going to be among them because the agreement was that the Israelis released would only be women and children. I mean, as a father, uh, seeing uh, children and uh, mothers and uh, grandmothers being released is amazing. Some of those families I know personally and they became my family. Uh, I was happy with them when their loved ones were released and I was sad for them when they weren't released, but you can't deny that the, the feeling isn't complete. And the fact that all and the rest of the hostages are still there isn't easy for us, especially given the fact that all as a two-year-old son at home looking for him and for his mother, 
unfortunately he already lost his mother but his father is still out there and we need to get him back and i'll do everything in my power to get him back whatever it takes and him and the rest of the hostages On October the 7th, more than 1,200 people were murdered. There still isn't an exact number because some of their bodies were left unrecognizable and have to be identified from their DNA. That work continues. More than 240 hostages were taken that day. At the time of recording this program, on the 29th of January, Israel says 28 of those kidnapped are dead. Hamas claims that number is higher. One was rescued by the Israel Defense Forces. Four Israeli hostages were released by Hamas before a deal brokered by Qatar saw a brief ceasefire. 105 hostages were released as part of that deal. There are 11 dead hostages whose bodies have been recovered. Three of those were mistakenly killed by the IDF. Some 240 Palestinian prisoners and detainees have been freed from Israeli jails. 132 of those taken in Israel on the 7th of October remain in captivity in Gaza. You've been listening to the documentary from the BBC World Service with me, Anna Foster. The Israeli Hostages was produced by Louise Clark. The editor was Claire Fordham and it was mixed by Richard Hannaford.